You're listening to Power Athlete Radio, a podcast dedicated to empowering your performance every damn day. Join former NFL pro and power athlete founder John Wellborn as he dissects the greatest minds in strength, conditioning, and more. So whether your goal is to be the hammer, destroy mediocrity, or simply move the dirt, you've come to the right place. Now with the warm-up done, let the gains begin. Hey, Power Athlete Nation. Buckle up. I got a great podcast in store for you today with our good friend, Zach Evan Esch, the mayor of strength and conditioning, and also the purveyor of everything old school. Zach is a coach out in New Jersey. He works with young athletes through his training facility, the Underground Strength Gym, but also works as a strength coach at a local high school and really just uh, goes everywhere. We recently ran into each other at Summer Strong and decided we should jump back on Power Athlete Radio. I believe that this Power Athlete Radio with Z makes him the most interviewed power athlete radio guest. So he has that moniker, but we get into a lot of stuff, not only with coaching kids, what's uh, the state of strength conditioning that we're seeing it and also leave it open for another one in the near future where we really get into um, men and losing their identity and why they need to train and why they need to cultivate and continue to develop this gift of strength. So buckle up, Mr. Zach Ebenesh. What is the state of strength conditioning on that level. Like, you know, Oh my God. I can't believe you opened up this can of worms to go with Johnny. <laughs> you know, I was sitting up to uh, got up at like 5. AM this morning. I've just been working all morning, crafting questions to be able to paint <laughs> the most alum power athlete radio guest in history. So putting together the best catalog of questions. <laughs> the first one, let's, I'll go. let's go through, let's figure out a state of the union. I love it. All right. Number one, something that's it's been on my mind, not a whole lot. And maybe we're only seeing a a, um, like a small excerpt. But when I see a lot of the stuff in the colleges, we see squat, bench, clean, jump, sprint. I'm always shocked and I could be missing it that I don't see more dumbbell training. Maybe that just doesn't make it to the highlight reel. I don't see a lot of overhead work. Um, I don't see carries. I'm shocked I don't see carries, at least for linemen who need to really build durability. Um, And then at the high school setting, we're seeing some very advanced things, which it all depends on uh, the, how do you say, the consistency of the program. So if I might see a high school uh, video, of athletes doing like, you know, the banded Yuri drill that Cal put out. It's, you put the band in the squat rack and you do like the hip knee. I'm seeing that. I'm seeing deep squats. I'm seeing beautiful cleans. So what what is the state of it? I think we've gotten away from brilliance with the basics and simple things done savagely well, which, by the way, is a quote from a power athlete episode. Do you know who said simple things done savagely well? Uh, Which I think it was Fred Hatfield. uh, It may have been. I believe it was Rudy when Rudy was talking about kind of the state of current day SF guys compared to when he went through SF and the lesser options they had with weapons. He was basically saying, you know, they could get the job done with the most basic weapons, whereas today, SF guys have all this fancy say, stuff. Say that quote again. Simple things done savagely well. Actually, he said brilliance with the basics. I get him and Jim Kiritsi mixed up on uh, who, who said what. Um, Jim Kiritsi, I think, said simple things done savagely well. Rudy said brilliance with the basics, and he was referring to shooting tactics and uh, weapons availability for SF guys. Well, if uh, Carizzi said it, you got to do it. You got to do it in the Carizzi voice. You know, but that, you know that that requires me to stay up to two a.m. smoking cigarettes for six months. <laughs> I'm Jim Carizzi, and uh, I lost my voice a hundred years ago from smoking cigarettes. And then you meet him, and I expected him to be seven foot tall, like Bill Brad. <laughs> I was like, "You, this voice, this is fucking hilarious." Let's go. Well, his uh, first of all, his last name is not Carizzi, and it's like no matter what, you don't want to listen. His last name is Karitsi. And you I just, know. I think you, I think you don't want to listen to the proper. Fuck up his name just because I know it fucking stings him. <laughs> like Karitsi, get over here. It's like a Ritz cracker. You're like a Ritz. 
Yes. So, all right. What we didn't really, or I didn't really answer the question. The state of the union of strength and conditioning is, I think it's a mess. There's, there's no kind of common sense middle ground. And to say there's none of it, meaning there's not enough of it. Everybody's extreme to one uh, end of the spectrum to the other, rather than saying, you know what? Sometimes I do like that exercise. But as you've said before, Johnny, it has to be polarizing. And sometimes drills that I watch or movements that I watch, I think to myself, hey, man, you're preparing a football player or you're preparing a wrestler or even, you know, one of the teams I train the most at my high school is girls soccer. Every time I observe a girls soccer game, the amount of impact and collisions that those girls make. I go back and all I think is we actually need to get stronger and build more durability. I'm seeing so much collisions at full speed, heading a soccer ball that's been kicked 50 plus yards. So I'm thinking trunk stability, trap strength, neck strength. I don't think of all this fancy stuff. You know, yesterday I had a basketball team come in. They really haven't trained much all year. And it was squats supersetted with skater jumps it was incline dumbbell bench supersetted with any kind of row recline row chest support row some of them did a seated cable row and then i had to show them how to do bulgarian split squats but if you watch everything online you would think they have to do you know active foot heel elevated heavy split squats they did bodyweight split squats the bodyweight split squats kick their ass and they superseded bodyweight split squats with one arm carries and any kind of arm exercise. So the state of the union of strength and conditioning is all over the place. Um, I don't know if people really, you know, is this their philosophy or did they just kind of go down the rabbit hole where they're married to a certain person where you're so influenced by it that you have blinders on for everything else. But John, I think it's weird that we've gotten to a place where people make like back squats are the devil. That's a problem. Like it's so bad to put a weight on your back. Um, We interrupt this episode with a shameless self promotion. Do you want to build thick sidewalk splitting slabs of muscle? Let me introduce you to Jack street. Get access to the same tried and true training methods I followed during my 10 years in the NFL, all to walk into training camp at 308 pounds at sub 8% body fat. Punch your ticket to the gain train and join thousands of residents already following Jack Street. Head to powerathletehq.com forward slash Jack Street and claim your seven day free trial today. Now back to the show. You know, and we know where this started. I mean, it all started with... Mike Boyle's original attack on it. And, you know, the problem is, is one, I think he was trying to be polarizing because we had him on the podcast a few times and he's extremely agreeable. Uh, I think for his population that he's working with, with high level hockey players, um, they had a ton of wear and tear and he did not see the benefit of doing some form of axial loading. Now, the problem is when you make these kind of all encompassing, you know, uh, generalizations or call them whatever they are, that, you know, the death of the back squat, uh, there's context, but unfortunately people don't read for context anymore. So one of the fundamental movement patterns, X axis hinge, all of a sudden gets thrown out, you know, Mike Boyle says it's bad. Now all of a sudden I'm in Mike Boyle's camp. This goes back to the talk that I did for Sornex, um, last weekend or two weekends ago, where I was talking about authenticity. I really believe that most of what people say and think are not their own opinions or ideas. So what they effectively do is they listen, and this can be a good thing and a bad thing, but what they do is they listen, and then they thatch ideas together. They pull from here and here and here, and they create this thatching, this this armor of thought is what I call it. And uh, it allows them to have a framework to work from because they don't have original idea. Uh, it's you know, Like I said, it could be good or bad because you get to effectively go out and test drive a lot of different ideas. It's like going to a dealership and test driving a car, but ultimately it's not your car and it's not your idea. So the reason that it's inauthentic is because it's not your own work. Um, You know, something I've strived for with Power Athlete for a long time is to create my own methodology, my own understanding of training, this blueprint that we lay on top of all other training to decide whether or not 
it's an athletic form of training and will it foster and develop athleticism? Um, do you need to jump? Sure. Do you need to squat? Sure. Do you need to work on one leg? Yeah. Do you need to, uh, you know, lift kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, body weight, all these things? Yes. And what happens is, is people, I think, um, let me use this analogy. I think when people get into strength conditioning, especially as a coach early, it's like buying a Christmas tree, right? So they buy a Christmas tree that first year, maybe put some garland on it, maybe an ornament or two, and it looks kind of sparse. Every year, you know, your mom or whoever it is gives you more and more ornaments. 10 years down the road, the Christmas tree is packed with shit. It like it's covered in ornaments. You can't even see the tree. So what happens if you just keep going for 30 years and next thing you know, the Christmas tree is so overly packed, you got boxes of shit. You can't figure out where to put anything. Uh, a smart strength coach, as his tree starts to get cluttered, he takes all the th ornaments off, throws them all the way and goes for a different theme. And you're starting and you're constantly working to create the perfect blend of Christmas tree and ornaments and garland and all that. Um, you know, it's, uh, we do a different Christmas tree almost every year. So I'll do a, you know, natural tree. I have a fake tree that's white. You know, I mean, it's just like constantly changing these things up. And I really am at the point where looking at people's programs and what people are doing is they're just thatching other people's ideas and they're just adding ornaments to the tree. And the reason that it looks cluttered is because it's inauthentic. People don't have a centralized philosophy to work from anymore. You know, the, uh, the one thing I did appreciate about Louis Simmons among, among other things is Westside had a system. Here was the system of Westside. You're going to do something heavy. You're going to do dynamic work and then you're going to hit the rep method. And he had these different methods and Louis was very, very, up front where the methods came from, where he pulled them from, you know, Zadiskorsky and Berkashansky, uh, you know, the Russian training manuals, you know, Louis saw what they were doing, was influenced and then created his own system based on it. Very different than what they were doing so much so that, you know, Berkashansky, for those of you guys <laughs> really young, uh, Dr. Berkashansky ran a forum. You remember this? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, downloaded a, aspect of the form that was like conversations in conjugate training it's like james thinker smith <clears throat> zatiorski yeah very deep people would get on there and high level coaches and dipshits of like would get on there and ask questions and he would answer them and one of the questions that popped up all too often was what do you think of the west side program what do you think of the west side system and his comment was you know we did it very different louis using it in a concurrent training model we, we did it within block periodization. There was a max effort phase. There was a dynamic phase and they did it in these kind of block periodizations where Louis did it in a more concurrent model where he was kind of waving into it. And, uh, uh, I remember Berkashansky's comment was different than what we did, but brilliance in it alone, you know, in, in itself. So, uh, you know, and also, um, Dr. Romanoff and I had a pretty long conversation about it where he said, you know, Louis is a beautiful mind. He's, he looked at something that the Russian sports scientists took a ton of time to create. He cut it up into a million pieces, put it back and made his own masterpiece. So you really have to respect somebody, you know, that looks at something, understands his own system and then puts it out there and look how impactful it is. You know, at the time, uh, people outside of Fred Hatfield weren't really focusing on compensatory acceleration and speed work. It just wasn't happening. You know, guys were kind of you. Uh, you know, talking to Ed Cohn, who we got to meet at Sorenex, which was awesome. Talking to him about his original training, it was so basic. Oh man! It's like I tried to move the heaviest. Weight I, could. <clears throat> I mean, it was uh, like, you know, hey, I started at eights, then I did sixes, then I did fours, then I did doubles. I went to the contest and did singles. I mean, it was uh, like very simple, archaic, and br and and uh, brutal. Uh, Linear. I, yeah. I mean, it was, uh, you know, you listen to these people now and they talk about all this stuff. I mean, he's like, I just tried to move heavy weight fast. And when the weight got heavier, I just tried to move it faster. I mean, it was talking to him about the simplicity. He also has a anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic ratios that I've never seen. I mean, that dude's arm and leg length to torso. I mean, what's he five? Yeah. He must have a six foot five wingspan. This episode of power athlete radio is powered by train heroic the most immersive strength training app experience on the market. We've built an online training business by partnering with Train Heroic to deliver all of our world-class training programs like Jack Street, Hammer, Field Strong, and Grindstone. To learn which power athlete training program best suits your goals, 
head to powerathletehq.com slash training. And if you're a coach looking to build a business with the best training tech in the business, head to trainheroic.com slash powerathletehq. And now back to the show. His arms were <clears throat> definitely creeping or his hands were definitely creeping towards the knees, which makes you a great deadlifter. He wasn't super tall. Like he said, he was inspired by Franco Colombo. So he saw somebody that's like his stature um, and those long arms, you know, knuckle draggers make you great for squatting, deadlifting. Well, he, um, to, right, yeah. Normally long arm people are great deadlifters. He was long armed and not extremely long legged. So he had this rare distinction of, of having, you know, the torso and the legs and the lower body of a squatter and the upper body arms of a pole. So, I mean, his, just his strange kind of ratios of limb length makes him probably, you know, if not, you know, I mean, you, you would have to say Eddie Cohen is probably, you know, I mean, if not number one, number two or three top power lifter ever. Yeah. Um, Two things come to mind. <clears throat> Speaking of like Eddie Cohn's programming, um, it sounded very simple, but he was super intuitive. He learned in a way that you and I learned, which is uh, initially through training and rubbing elbows with strong AF people. And I think that is one of the most crucial ways for anybody to learn. I really think especially the uh, college strength coach interns should be in my opinion, they should be lifting with a team. That would be crucial. So they start learning what it feels like to go through that style of training. Um, and Eddie, with that simple style of training, I'm going to say this, it takes an immense amount of discipline to know that that works. And I think today's people, whether it's an athlete or a strength coach, they would say that's too boring. It doesn't excite me. What, you know, what does this sell? You know, 12 weeks of doing two to three weeks of 12 reps of deadlifts, squat bench. Then I'll do two to three weeks or two weeks of tens. It was just linear. And then what people were like, Hey, how did you measure bar speed? He's like, if it felt right and it moved fast, I know that the weight could go up well, now in what he was doing. Uh, higher sense is that you <clears throat> He was setting his base and he was creating a, a base of GPP and he was, you know, his base level of strength. I mean, Louis, uh, Louis had a different way of doing it. Louis looked at the barbell as sports specific. Hey, um, if I go into contest, I don't get paid to lift fives. So I don't get paid to get lift threes. I get paid to lift singles. So he put all of his guys into this kind of sport specific nature of heavy singles, max effort. Um, I remember, um, talking to him about how he would train a football player. And he's like, I would have you do nothing but fives, fives and triples. And I was like, no singles. He's like, no, um, you know, look at the time that it takes you to do a single doesn't relate to the kind of the time domain. I think five to seven seconds should be between three and five reps. So, well, I mean, that, you know, that, that was specific to each individual. And then Louie looked at it like, okay, we're going to do our sports specific work under the barbell where we're going to get our volume work, where we're going to get our driver is in the accessory. That's non-specific to what we're doing. So that was a reverse hypers, dumbbells, all the work that he did. So I, I think it's pretty interesting to look at, like, you have to get the volume work. You have to get the top end work. Eddie Cohen just did it different. He did it similar to like Dan Green. Remember, I mean, Dan Green, did a ton of reps and only really used the barbell until he ended up, I mean, uh, until he got hurt and he started having to kind of rotate and use a, you know, safety squat bar and started kind of rotating through different movements just because he had to find a way to hit it without killing himself. Well, uh, and if you see me looking down, I'm just taking notes because I'll forget what I wanted to say, but so did uh, <clears throat> Kaz also did. You'd see him benching five sets of eight to 12 behind the neck press, four sets of eight. Um, and just speaking of the volume that athletes did, and same thing with Louie, that volume of accessory work, he said was about 80% to the, you know, compared to the main lift 20%. So two things that, that came to my mind there was the accessory work. I think we have gotten so conservative that we fear doing kind of this volume work. We're always talking about recovery and lifestyle and this and that. I mean, the reality is most athletes are operating at a deficit. Most of them, you know, the disciplined ones could put their phone away, get to bed, 
have a solid breakfast, but most of them, if they go to bed, they might be on their phone for a good one to two hours before they actually go to sleep. So they're automatically at a deficit. Um, but I think we got so caught up in like this optimal training, the recovery that I've even caught myself, John, sometimes getting overly conservative with training, meaning I wasn't doing sets of eight to 12 on barbell lifts for a long time until having this conversation with Eddie. And I found myself uh, not long ago, also going back and utilizing kind of earlier methods when I was less intelligent, those kind of early underground strength days of more odd objects, more overall volume. And, you know, like this five by five method or, or sets of five for football, do you know, I can't remember if you and I had this conversation or somebody else, but did you know why Louie started utilizing five by five for powerlifters and six by six and eight by eight for dynamic stuff? Do you know why he went to that? No, and oh, like in his when did he last go? few years? Oh, did he? Okay. He he spoke to um AJ Roberts about this <clears throat> and he said, um, you know why I got away from the doubles and triples, like eight by two, eight by three, twelve by two. He's like, because these newer powerlifters don't train as hard. He said they need more work to actually like get something out of it. So instead of doing eight by three, uh, whether it was max effort or dynamic effort. You could see some of the like later type videos where some of the lifters were recording things. So you would uh, see dynamic days of six by six. You would see heavy days of five by five. Yeah, no, he, um, when I was out there, the programming that we have since created with, um, you know, power athlete and we use compensatory acceleration and cat training and all that. And, um, a lot of those recommendations of doing fours, fives, and sixes for the speed work came from Louis's recommendations for training football players. And it was about time under tension and how much they're doing. Uh, you know, he's like, if a guy only gets to do two reps, I mean, so we were doing, you know, uh, one of the waves that we use, if you do a five RM, you come back and it's five by five at 80%. So when I worked through kind of the way that I do the rep max to compensatory acceleration waves, Louie was like, uh, I think it's great because you're waving through his five triples and singles, you know, based upon that kind of daily matrix. Um, but I mean, the issue comes down to, I think most people, especially what Louis saw, most guys kind of started within this kind of bodybuilding thing where they, you know, guys wanted to be big and strong. Uh, you know, very few kids, I'll say, I'll preface this lightly. Very few kids look at like the 400 pound obese power lifter guy that looks like he's just coughing up cheeseburgers. Uh, nobody looks at that and thinks one day I hope to fucking have, you know, uh, heart attack and diabetes to try to chase one RMs. I mean, like nobody, like I can't imagine being 12 years old and being like, ah, I want to be the world's best, you know, power lifter diabeto. And, you know, so most kids kind of similar to me, similar to you saw big, strong guys. Um, you know, I tell the story of seeing Lyle Alzado at the beach and being like, fuck, I want to be big and strong. That dude was big and strong. Uh, I didn't see, you know, we went, uh, Art Shell, who was my my basketball coach, I don't know if I ever told you that. My peewee basketball coach was Art Shell, who was left tackle for the Raiders. Oh, damn. Yeah, so he was my peewee basketball coach. So uh, we got to go to a few Raiders games, and I got to meet a bunch of the players when I was in middle in middle school. And, you know, you get to see, like, Howie Long and Lyle Alcedo and uh, some of these guys. And, like, dude, they were, you know, Bo Jackson. I mean, these dudes were put together. I mean, even a lot. Oh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if any 12-year-old kid – sees these guys and it's like, man, I want to have diabetes one day. I want to be a, you know, fat as fuck. They just don't. So you get into this and you know, whether it be like the barbarian brothers, I mean, I remember watching the barbarian brothers in that movie they were in. Um, God, I'm going to Google. Yeah. Remember the movie? They were like in the cab, uh, the cab drivers. Well, yeah, <clears throat> they, so they were in a lot of like sea level movies. Yeah. No, they were in DC cab. Yes. Remember with uh with uh Mr. T, but they were also in that uh that movie where they were like actually barbarian. It was called the Barbarians. That's how they got the bar. Yeah. But like that was like I was like 10 years old when that movie came out. And seeing these dudes and being like, man, I want to be big and strong. And the training that they were doing was bodybuilding. You know, it was Muscle Beach, it was Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, pumping iron. That's kind of what I think most of the people got into. Um, you know, whether they were training for football or training just to be big and strong. And then, you know, you know, basically transition into powerlifting. 
at some point when they realize, you know, they're probably not going to be a professional bodybuilder, but I can be pretty competitive in powerlifting. And then all of a sudden you're there and next thing you know, you're 365 pounds trying to move this weight. So I, uh, I think a lot of these kids now because of, uh, social media or whatnot have more access to these things. So they're diving in on it and, you know, I can just strap up a suit and look like a rubber band man and lift some heavy weights and, you know, get my, get myself a total. Well, the, uh, bodybuilders of seventies and early eighties, if you recall, they were the early days guys that entered world's strongest man, Franco, Lou Ferrigno. One of the guys was an NFL player. Um, so if you look up world's strongest man, like 1978, 1980, first name was Mike. They were using that, you know, that wrist roller that Sorenex has the one that you stand on. Yep. They were using that, uh, in the late seventies, you see the Zuvers plates that pops has. So from the silver era of bodybuilding to the golden era, Arnold kind of brought in the body part split training, but Arnold competed in powerlifting events. And when he was in Austria, he would enter, you know, they would have like deadlift competitions in the bars, very similar to what the guys organized at the last two summer strong events where you're doing like a, a bottoms up hold while drinking beer. So those guys implemented powerlifting movements. Whereas today I find this very interesting. The, you know, the chemical warfare of bodybuilding, you know, I see, I saw a recent video that said like back training in the nineties. And it's like all the guys doing bent over rows and being aggressive and then back training today. And it's like a guy like hanging off the lat pull down machine, doing like a one arm cable row, twisting to the side. And we are seeing, I'm, I live it cause I'm coaching at a high school. I saw a high school kid doing on a tricep bar, like wrist curls. I said, Hey, Sam Sulik, remember this. Sam Sulik is on more shit than a racehorse. So instead of you doing those wrist curls, why don't you grab the 80 pound kettlebells and do five sets of farm walks? Like that's the best thing you could do. But they don't realize just as I didn't realize, you know, the amount of drugs involved, but I'm seeing guys well, doing bent over barbell row with a 70 pound barbell that you would normally curl with. They're doing bent over barbell rows with that as part of their off season training. Well, part, and so part of this, this, this is why, because the research came out that said <clears throat> no difference between three reps and 30 reps as long as you're going to failure in terms of hypertrophy. Where did you see that again? The, the research uh, research came out probably within the last three years that in terms of hypertrophy, there's no difference in three reps versus 30 reps as long as you are working to failure. Where was that published? <laughs> uh, I will say, right? But the problem with that is there's a dramatic <laughs> difference, right? There's a difference between hypertrophy and strength. Uh, there's a way to develop both at the same time, but unfortunately sets of 30 aren't going to make you strong. Uh, right. I wrote in you know, my 42 things that I'd learned up to that point many years ago. Uh, there was a remarkable difference between the physical appearance of football players that lifted over 85% with consistency and those that didn't, I could see it. I, I would, I would always, you know, constantly, uh, doing this you know, visual cue check on everybody to see what kind of weights people put on the bar. Cause I was competitive. I wanted to know what people were lifting. I saw guys never put more than 315 on a bar and it showed, uh, in terms of a back squat. I, I saw guys never grab heavier than hundred pound dumbbells. Uh, my goal coming out of training camp was like one fifties for a set of eight to 12, you know, and then somewhere if we had heaviers up to one eighties and, you know, somewhere four to six reps for one eighties, if I could hit the two hundreds for reps, that was pretty good. Uh, and being able to kind of push these weights because at the end of the day, um, and maybe this is Zangus's influence, nobody gets excited about seeing somebody lift lightweights, <clears throat> the classic George Zangus lines. If you came in and let's say we were, you know, we'd always warm up and unfortunately George's training days on Saturdays were like three to four hours. There was probably 20 to 30 sets of squat. And as we were warming up, if the, you know, and this is kind of, this is indicative of age and just beginners. Like one week I would squat well and the next week I wouldn't. 
And I could never figure out why my squat was never consistent. So as we were starting to warm up, all of a sudden you're like missing or, you know, Hey, you got to do five reps and you get four or, or, you know, the weight gets out in front of you, you get tacoed and you're having a bad day. And, uh, George would look at you and be like, having a rough one. I think you should pull the weight off and and make it a form day. Hmm. And that was George's like backhand slap. And I remember him saying like, nobody got, or what was it? It was, uh, if lifting weights made us strong, nobody would lift these heavy ones because it's fucking hard. Everybody's good yeah. at it. It's like, I'm not impressed by people who live life with lightweight. So for George to be like, oh, take the weight off and just make it a form day was his way of basically slapping you in the face and being like, get your shit together, get the fuck out. And at that point, you had to look at it like, hey, man, I got to fight for every one of these reps. If he, calls me, if he calls me for five, I better get five. If I get four, he's going to fucking throw me out of this place. And, you know, while the hypertrophy might be very similar for, I think, for advanced athletes, for younger athletes, strength, which is a prior or strength should be a priority over hypertrophy. Like, I think you should work on getting really strong and do accessory work to drive it. But the primary driver should not be hypertrophy. It just shouldn't, um, you know, we were trying to get as strong as possible to get as strong as possible. We had to get bigger. So we had to do some bodybuilding work to try to get in there, but this correct. Is- uh, you know, I mean, I'm not going to hate on the dude cause one, I don't know him. Um, he's created a, a very interesting kind of, you know, cult of personality around what he's doing. Um, the issue though comes down to, he takes a ton of drugs and that's, yeah. just, <clears throat> it's not trend. That's not testosterone. I mean, the pumps he gets where it looks like his skin is ripping. Those pumps only come from insulin. So G. By- so when you, by t- the way, you take insulin, uh, the, the insulin acts as a transport, but what it does is it shuttles, uh, shuttles nutrients to that cell and the pumps that those guys get out of insulin, where it looks like they're all their skin is going to explode and their chest is going to explode or their legs. That is one of the insulin pumps and one of the side effects from insulin. Um, I've lifted weights for a long time. I can get a nice arm pump. I can get a good leg pump with BFR, but the, the type of pump where you feel like you're going to throw up and your skin's going to rip only comes from insulin and GH. Uh, I used to see that when I was, you know, bodybuilding. I remember guys would inject insulin in their stomach uh, after a workout. So I remember it's kind of growing up around that. But um, well, they you know, were talking take it before and after now. So what they'll do is they'll take it before. Yeah, and then they'll use like injectable L carnitine, and then they go hit like, you know, then they have to take a bunch of carbs during the workouts, or they're going to fucking crash. And so the reason that all of a sudden you see him just housing carbs. It's because he's, you know, avoiding that insulin crash. So he's figured out some chemistry. Uh, you know, I know he was on a bunch of Accutane before that. I mean, just covered in acne everywhere. But I mean, he posts a camera. He's super honest. I don't think he's honest about his drug stuff, but he's a pretty honest kid. And, you know, uh, has definitely created a ton of good content and created a cult of personality. So I don't mean to hate him in any way, but um, there is a interesting phenomenon Uh which I think is, is, is hilarious. I heard a, uh, uh, interview the other day with, um, Stan Efferding and, uh, Derek for more plates, more dates where, you know, these guys were talking about, you know, 30 years ago, these guys used to take X. I mean, I, I think one of like the hallmarks of bodybuilding is just lying about what you're taking. You know, those guys are like, uh, they, they always have underplayed it. I mean, Tom Platt's was at some interview talking about like, Oh, I only took five milligrams of this and five milligrams of this. I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> Like there are dudes that are taking like 10,000, you know, 10 grams of this stuff a week that don't have anywhere near your development. And you were a super responder with five. I mean, so I think a lot of guys are nervous about their legacy, so they don't want to admit to it, which I think becomes a problem because these young guys are into it and they start, you know, Hey, I'm going to take what he said. Nothing's happening. And they just keep taking more instead of they were just more honest and being like, no, I took a fucking pharmacy to do this and I'm going to probably die from it. So just steer clear. Yeah, I th- I'm not a fan of what I see with today's bodybuilding. But when you mentioned um, the heavy lifting, especially for younger athletes, this is what, you know, um, I'm not a fan of testing your one RM because of the psychology behind it. And do you know how to hold technique during a grind? And do you have the balls to just say, I'm not going to miss this rep? And I think most young athletes, the majority, are not there. As soon as the struggle happens or they feel a little bit off, they're ready to dump the bar. They're ready to give up. And so that's why I love what you're saying about fives, threes. That's why Jim Wendler's five, three, 
one works awesome. Uh, I did a podcast with Andy Baker. He's in Texas. Um, I forget the name of the area, but he's a um, starting strength guy. He's, he co-authored a book with Rip, and he does a real cool three-week cycle where he does eight, five, and then twos, and maybe a three. But I love the eights. Those are great for building muscle and building that base. Then that five is the blend of strength and muscle or strength endurance. And then you get to a double, maybe a triple, and it's uh, enough of a jump where you're really testing the strength. So I like that three-week mini cycle. But right now I'm going through uh, – I'm going to go through like probably a good long phase of these reps after – speaking with Ed Cohn, the just the difference is for guys like us who have a lot of mileage on the body from lifting, and you have mileage on the body from NFL plus lifting, you have to be a little more careful of doing 12s and 10s with barbell work because the barbell work, in my opinion, beats up the body the most. So I'm, I'm careful with this next training cycle that I'm experimenting with. Like I'm doing squats for sets of 10, deadlifts for sets of 10, uh, benching for sets of 10. I haven't done reps like that on barbell work in a long time, so I'm uh, kind of playing it by ear to see how my body responds. You have to periodize through the different uh, – <clears throat> um, you know, when um, Matt first came over and started training, he had never really done any – high rep type stuff. He had followed either cross at football, um, you know, and what he had done in his collegiate strength conditioning and power athlete. So, and never had fallen <laughs> any Jack street. It was all kind of field strong. So if anybody's never done any classic bodybuilding, you know, eights to 12, three to four sets, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. Um, it's, I think magic. And one of the things that he hit and he really struggles with is, uh, you know, the ability to control a rep, control the eccentrics and be able to push. He's always so busy racing through, trying to slow him down and actually get him to work through the full range of motion, which he does fine, but it just speeds through everything. So uh, I think really building that base and doing some of the class bodybuilding is extremely beneficial. And we do it in different blocks. Like right now we're in field strong. We're doing a block of hypertrophy, which will all be higher rep stuff. So being able to alternate through these, you know, different you know, rep ranges and different focuses, uh, I think, you know, is beneficial for all athletes. And if you don't go through it, then I think at some point you have to, and hopefully you kind of have a smart strength coach that in the off season, as you do a little bit more high rep, a little more classic bodybuilding, and then periodizes into <clears throat> some lower, a little more speed and a lot more dynamic. But one of the issues too, we ran into, and one of the, the things, the mistakes that I've made in the past that I no longer make as you're doing these higher reps and doing some of this classic bodybuilding, you have to continue to move athletically. That yes. involves, you know, uh, med ball work, um, something that form focuses on a transverse plane, X and Z axis. So being able to incorporate enough movements to foster and develop athleticism and keep you moving well are paramount. Just doing some classic bodybuilding and doing nothing that looks like an athletic form of training uh, does not bode well when you start trying to flip the switch and go back to the other side which I see it a ton with athletes at the high school level, you know, training at a high school when you have organized team workouts and then a kid says, well, I'm training on my own. And then they cannot move weights. They, they have no concept of cat. They have no concept of power. They've done so much squeezing and pumping that they have, the athleticism out of their body, which you would think, man, how do you do that as a teenager? Well, the difference I've said, um, I go, I'm going back to something we were talking about earlier, kind of this, um, what is, you know, the state of the union of strength and conditioning. Well, I was thinking to myself in the early years when I was training athletes in the early two thousands, speed and agility was not on my radar because the football players I trained would play pickup basketball in the springtime. Uh, they also, uh, if they played football, they either wrestled or played basketball in the winter. We had a ton of multi-sport athletes. Or so more guys ran track. Your guys ran track. Uh, we had also guys would do lacrosse today. We're really, missing that and i've i keep saying this if this makes sense to you john i've never seen athletes do so much stuff 
yet achieve so little in return, meaning they're going to train with you. Then they're going to their private sport skill coach. Then they're going to their private strength coach. Then they've got this thing at school, this camp, and there's no intensity behind anything because they're just trying to survive from the car ride to the next thing that they have to go to. And that's why, you know, it, do you, do I you, feel like we're seeing so many of these lack of durability. Do you think this is at the behest of their parents, that this is the parents sitting there trying to orchestrate this mix of training where they can effectively get them a scholarship or help them succeed? Yeah, let's let me speak as a dad myself who's in the thick of it with two high school kids, you know, uh, with tennis. It was my wife brought my daughter to Florida. She may have been like six years old and she saw what other tennis players were doing. And my daughter was uh, through all the way through high school. She would play basketball. She did soccer. We did swim. We had her involved in many things. And then freshman year, she played softball and was uh, extremely impressive for somebody who never played softball before. Tennis made her very athletic. Mm -hmm. She needs the volume of training because emotionally, she responds very well to it. I have to force her to take time off. With my son, I'll say this. We've gotten into all the travel baseball stuff, and travel baseball is very much like strength and conditioning. You have a different style of coaching and a different quality all the time. Just like I have kids at my high school who say, I go to a private strength coach. And yesterday I saw one of our uh, very, our like more high level athletes could not do a bodyweight squat over and over again, falling backwards, getting halfway down, no control of the eccentric. I said, fire your private strength coach because I get a bit fired up when we have people in the private sector who are, what are you doing? Are you bypassing brilliance with the basics? And doing so much fancy shit that we have kids that can't do a bodyweight squat, or I've had kids that what do you not do it. Like, like I, I always go back to mm -hmm. strength training, especially for young athletes, is about almost it's a protective mechanism. They're uh, uh, I hate to use the term antibiotics because uh, I don't think antibiotics are protective. Like you only take them if you really need them. But strength training to me is like how we used to view antibiotics, where if you got sick, I mean, these safeguarded you. Strength training is the base level of strength that you need to protect yourself when you're playing body sport. armor. Yeah, it is. I mean, like if you're going to go out and sprint as fast as you can, and at you know, unless you're 100 pounds where you're not heavy enough to hurt yourself, it's not an issue. The minute that you start getting big enough and strong, or just big enough in general to be able to hurt yourself, you have to be strong enough to protect yourself from dynamic movement from sprinting, from running, from change of direction, from other people. Uh, you know, my daughter's 12 plays on these, dude, this whole travel basketball thing is even more interesting because she got uh, recruited by four different teams to play. And I mean, what's crazy is they all, they want her to do is play in games. So it's like, Hey, we're going to play four games a weekend. <clears throat> they have one practice. And if I bring her there, there might be two kids show up to practice, but everybody shows up to the game. So I was, crazy. I was looking for, some form of like off season basketball where she would practice a few days a week, work on her skills, and then maybe play one game. Developmental. So, yeah. I talked to her coach and what's hilarious. I, I talked to her coach the other day and he's like, nobody signed up for the practice. So it looks like Jamie's going to be getting personal workouts. I'm like, perfect. Well, uh, <clears throat> we do it three days a week. And the coach was like, I guess, I guess you're going to get personal. So he's going to take her or uh, I'll drop her off sit there and he, they just work on ball handling skills and shooting. Cause you know, she's like a, a pretty good player. She's got good rebounding skills can like, you know, get the ball out. She just struggles at shooting cause she hasn't had enough opportunity because you don't. And I keep telling her, you don't learn to shoot in a game because the minute you go pull up a bunch of girls, like run at you and crash into you. So you're always learning to shoot under duress. That's not mm. shoot. You learn to shoot in like a non-stressful situation where you go up, you measure the basket and you develop your skill so that when all of a sudden you put them in a game and now all of a sudden you got 50 people trying to swat the ball out of your hands. Now all of a sudden you have all of that muscle memory. So trying to explain it to her that you don't develop your game in the game. You develop your game in practice and then you use the game 
to fine tune or more importantly, show what you learned in practice. So like trying to get back to like, Hey, like I would rather her practice five days a week and play a game, you know, maybe pick up once a week, but that's not how this stuff works. The parents will only pay if they, you know, if the kids are playing in tournaments every weekend and they get a Jersey and they have to go to this stuff. And I think it's just a lot of uneducated parents that never played at a high level and have no fucking. Yes. John, not even you don't, I'd never competed at a high level um, in college even, but I competed and trained at, I don't, I don't know if I would say high level, but I was super competitive and I put in the work of training. Now, I think today the parents don't know the difference between this basketball coach versus that basketball coach. Like going back to what I just said, one of the best athletes in this specific sport at our school could not do a bodyweight squat. I had another kid in the winter time who said he goes to a private coach. He did not know how to do a dumbbell bench. He did not know how to lap the weight when he's done just, you know, dangerous techniques. And so what is happening is if parents didn't compete in sport in high school and take it seriously, I think then there's a whole lot of confusion. You and I have knowledge of, I know people don't like to hear about this, you know, the early Soviet and Eastern European European training model was really the best training model for youth. Forget about the drugs. But look at how they put kids into multiple sports. They had a high-level coach in the younger years. And, you know, in America, we tend to have local parents who, you know, that could really go backwards and sideways. I've experienced that through through baseball in a heartbreaking way. But the old European and uh, Soviet method, you had a high-level coach with the youth. They were... Uh, exposed to multiple sports, movement patterns, proper strength training, age-appropriate strength training. And then they moved the athlete into the sport that was best suited for them physically as well as psychologically. And so my son, in his younger years, uh, we played a lot of different sports, but he wrestled through fifth grade. My son is not a mean kid. You know, my old wrestling coach, I'm still in touch with him. And he says to wrestle, you know, you got, you need a little bit of darkness. You need some sort something kind of wrong with you upstairs. Is that the case with everybody? No. But when you wrestle at a high level, um, you need to be able to have some sort of alter ego, flip the switch happening. And if you're a nice guy, you got to be that AJ Ferrari. I, I don't think we should even allow his name to enter this uh, uh, podcast. Absolutely. I'm, I'm throwing okay. the AJ Ferrari out there merely because I'm sure Matt will listen to this one because we're on it. Uh, you know, Matt or AJ Ferrari is who Matt really dreamed of being. <laughs> he can't grow the mullet. And, you know, he's not Italian. He's Polish. So having a Polish AJ Ferrari just wouldn't, you know, it'd be like AJ Polinski. I have to come up with a good ski on there, Polinski. But um, no, it's uh, um, I think like I, uh, you know, and I, I always hate getting into this. I God, no, that's not how I was raised. But I mean, I, I've told the story on here many times. I told my dad I wanted to lift weights, and me only morons lift weights. It's counting to ten over and over again. Well, John, and but I mean, so so then as a kid, because my dad wasn't all for it, which is which is super interesting because. You know, for my kids, I mean, we have a, a weight room at, at the house. I mean, we have a, a fucking training facility. We have yep. professional athletes and people showing up to train. And me trying to convince my 12-year-old daughters that strength training will help their sports, like their sport, is like trying to like talk NASA into like not going to the moon. They like, need their friends to train with them and uh-huh. then <clears throat> they will do it. So I, I took Jamie to the movie the other day with one of her friends who plays across and I, I'm, and the, the mom dropped her off. So I met the mom and I was like, trying to like, Hey, is she, does she want to lift weights? Because if she wants to come lift weights, like I will gladly, I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. I will gladly, like you can come train in a private facility. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, it's a crazy deal, but, um, I, wait, John, did the mom say she already has a private strength coach? Cause that would have been the best. <laughs> no, uh, she was, uh, um, I will say this about uh, Jamie's friend. Her friend is shorter and pretty muscly, 
like pretty stout, like probably be a pretty good gymnast. Uh, I think she was. So now she plays lacrosse, uh, pretty stout. Like, like if she lifted weights, like she would be pretty powerful and her sister plays ice hockey. Her older sister plays ice, ice hockey. So she's pretty stout too. And she's a good skater is what her mom told her. So, um, they're, you know, uh, I told Jamie, I'm like, Jamie, like if you can suck in some of these girls into being training partners, like, uh, you know, like, uh, it's funny. Cause this, uh, um, this summer, Jamie was, I was like, you know, what, what do you want to do? She's like, I want apps. She's like, I, I feel like at school, all like the real pretty girls have apps. I'm like, first of all, no pretty girls have apps, uh, at least, <laughs> at least at 12 years old. But if you want to have them, that's a function of one diet and two exercise. If you want to get abs and you want to be strong, like hundred percent, all I need is three days a week. And at the end of the summer, if you listen to what, uh, if you let your mom do your diet and you eat what you're supposed to, you will have abs. You'll be jacked. Uh, she has the genetics for it and her sister too. Um, but just trying to convince them to do it. And I think that it's so readily available. I mean, uh, I was 14 years old, uh, begging my mom for a ride and then taking the bus home from the gym. Like, yes. like, uh, you know, until my buddy Tasso Papadakis came along, he had a car, he would drive and pick me up and we go to the gym. I mean, <laughs> like this was a function. Um, you know, we, we start, I started driving pretty young, but I remember being like, 13 years old and my older brother, like I'm not, Eddie would have been 15. So I would have been 11 or 12, uh, us like driving to the gym and going to these places. And there was a tennis club, um, that we used to go to that my brother played tennis. So we used to give people's names to sneak in and use their gyms. I mean, yeah. anything that we could do to lift weights. I did. Oh my God. I had a buddy <laughs> because, uh, you can't buy a well-fed, well, well, I guess you can now, but uh, you, you can help with a well-crafted physique. But being in shape is by far the greatest flex. Being big and strong is a flex because you, at some point, have to do the work. You can't go to the Rolex shop and buy it. You can't order it over Amazon. I mean, you can take drugs, and but I mean, you know, for all the drugs Sam Sulik takes, he still fucking busts his ass, monitors all his calories. I mean, the guy films oh, yeah. workouts every day, and while... It's not what you would call technically perfect because he's doing a bunch of crazy fucking half reps, but the dude is working towards failure in every single movement. It also helps to be 21, 22 years old, but I mean, the kid's busting his ass and the receipts that he's getting, he takes his shirt off, he flexes and he's figured it out. Um, you know, I got a lot of respect for his work ethic and his consistency and, uh, you know, you know, just his blind dedication to this is what he wants to do and nobody's kind of de default to <clears throat> I, I grew up seeing that, you know, the gyms I grew up in, that's how bodybuilders trained to failure with forced reps, then partials, then drop sets, then two guys lifting the bar for you. So you could do more negative. So intensity was inbred, inbred in me by just observing. I absorbed it. Uh, but I want to go back to you talking about, you know, parents being delusional. John, do you remember, you know, in your teenage years, parents you know booing a coach booing a referee screaming i don't recall that kind of behavior as what we see now um i'll just tell you i just went through this uh my son is eight right just turned eight um so he plays like the, some of the kids are eight and nine a little older than him but um excuse me i've been drinking my element salty drink makes me burp uh, yeah, i didn't know they had that in a can oh my god these canned element drinks I don't mean to do like an infomercial for them, but fuck, dude, these things are phenomenal. I, Good for Rob Wolf. He's crushing. It allows Rob to just make political um, Instagram posts. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Rob is is able to finally do what he's really best yes. at, which is just be prickly and smart and drop knowledge bombs that just crush souls. I I feel like um, I support Rob Wolf and I support his mission of staying salty. I love Rob. I feel like Rob's business being was like this. Listen, people. We need to fucking create something so I could make political posts on Instagram and just step the fuck away from this business. Uh, and they're like, we got an idea. Rob's problem is <clears throat> Rob was right too early. Yeah. Everything Rob has written, everything, he's been such an early adopter and he was been the thought leader. Everything else that you see are people just ripping off Rob Wolf. It's kind of like the Mauro de Pasquale anabolic diet. Mm. And Rob. Right. Mar listen. Mauro did the anabolic diet. Every person yeah. that's been doing carb cycling ever since to the point where I saw um, Christian Thibodeau do, hey, I uh, 
I started doing a carnivore diet. I felt better Then I wasn't feeling better. Now I'm going to do an anabolic diet where I'm just going to eat high protein, moderate fat, no carb. And then I'm gonna do a carb refeed. And I'm like, and he actually, he should have just said, Hey, I'm just going to go back to what Mauro De Pasquale wrote in the nineties because it, it, All right. <clears throat> I, I still do it too. I eat a high protein diet. I uh, might not eat a lot of carbs every fourth day. I do a carb refeed and it tends to work pretty well. So yeah. I'm all that original stuff. Right. Well, Okay, we need to go back to our first topic. This, this, uh, the title of this episode could be the ADD episode. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all over the place, but you were talking about coaches getting influenced by oh. other coaches with methodology. And well, that I, that stems back to my talk that I did at Sornex on authenticity. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason that I gave that talk where I did was it was a message for young strength coaches that it's okay to thatch yourself with older, more experienced strength coaches, like listen to the Charlie Francis, listen to all of these, uh, thought leaders that have created, you know, the Cal Dietz of the world, the people that have created original thought, listen to what they're doing, be influenced by it, then figure out your own shit. And at some point move to often to become authentic, nothing wrong with just parroting other people's stuff. But at some point as an adult, you have to move out of your parents' house. You have to, you know, start paying your own cell phone bill Give credit where credit is due. Don't rip people off, but start having your own ideas. And the only way you do that is in the crucible of training athletes. Like, for example, you know, when I started working with uh, Victor and the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys, I had never trained these guys. Uh, I didn't necessarily know a ton about their sport. So I went and got a white belt and started training in their sport, started training them and seeing where the limiting factors were and developed a whole training program called Dragon Slayer around those individuals taking into account the demands of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and training at a high level. And, you know, it, it, uh, you know, when people come on and they look at the different programs, there's pieces of this, it's kind of a full body three day a week field strong with a, you know, heavy, you know, old school Zach Evan day mixed in, and it allows people to get really good, but I wouldn't have been able to develop that program if I didn't have the athletes in front of me to test it on. Yeah. You, and then I go back to what I said earlier, you also need to train and a couple of years ago, two summers ago, I did my certification at uh, Sornex HQ and the interns from USC came over and they weren't big guys. And all I wanted to say to them is like, guys, you need to read the book Super Squats and you need to fucking do something that puts muscle on you because you guys might not even be squatting what some of these guys are benching. And I think... We get so caught up in sitting behind a phone or computer looking at YouTube when the best learning is twofold. You have to get your hands dirty, train people. Uh, You have to spend a lot of time. That's what an internship is for, really kind of exhausting your coaching muscles. But you also need to do the damn thing yourself. Otherwise, you can't enter what's going on in the athlete's mind when he or she is struggling or under fatigue or training and it's, you know, near a big competition, have you done that yourself? If not, you know, there's opportunities now for people to compete in sports and events. But, uh, you know, when you talk about those influences, you mentioned the barbarian brothers and you mentioned like benching 180 pound dumbbells. That's what they did. That's what Vic Richards did. They would do high volume days where they didn't count sets. They said, okay, we're going to do this exercise for an hour until some or until somebody quits. And that might be two hours. Or uh, I was talking about Arnold's education of a bodybuilder. When I read that book through high school, you know, that was the kind of the uh, genesis of my philosophy of no rules training. Arnold said I would sometimes just do pull ups until my hands couldn't grip the bar anymore. Or I would go to the woods with a training partner on a Saturday with 250 pounds of weights and we would squat until we couldn't stand. And then we would um, uh, invite women and drink wine and uh, grill, you know, meat over the fire like gladiators. And that's where I came up with the idea of like the gladiator project, kind of this simple, primitive training that was, quote unquote, breaking the rules. And so I'm a believer in don't just learn from what's in front of you, learn from what came before us. You mentioned Louis Simmons. Um, remember when I first met you in Connecticut, I came to a power athlete cert. I gave you a book that Jim Wendler gave me 
yeah. that was gift. It was gifted to him by Dr. Ken Leisner, which was the original West Side Barbell articles from 68 to 72, Muscle Builder and Power. Yeah. And those articles had um, eccentrics, pauses, uh, training from different positions inside the uh, York isometric rack, mm-hmm. box squats. They did deadlifts from different positions. And it's interesting looking back, you know, 1968 is before you and I were born. So we're talking over 50 years ago. Um, you know, there's, there is new training methods like what Cal is bringing. <clears throat> and so I look at what Cal is doing and I found a hole in our training, not enough eccentric work to help our field athletes and court athletes improve change of direction, improve the durability of the knee. Uh, we didn't do enough isometric work, which has really helped athletes learn positions. So I'm always trying to like kind of break what we're doing. And I'll listen to anybody when they're talking about training. And you've said this before, I don't have to agree with everything you say, but I want to try to learn one thing from you. I'm maybe going to absorb one thing from you, or I might get an idea where it's like, I need to probably back off from that one thing. And so uh, our conversations at Summer Strong, those are my favorites because We are in conversation. There's, I'm not, I don't do very well with listening to a lecture type event. I do better off, like if I attend those early days CrossFit football and you talk and then we train, we do the damn thing. That's one of the, um, uh, one of the interesting pieces of Sornix is there's a lot of lecture and then there's training. And I think being able to break it up into a better where you learn and you, you know, do it. But I mean, they also have some people there. So they're, they're just, they're doing the best they can, uh, you know, to be able to manage. I mean, we put on events, we've done that and it's never an easy task. So being able to manage all those people and feed all those people, I mean, is a logistical nightmare. It's but, crazy. You know, we always had eccentrics in the program. The reason being is. Uh, you need, what is it? A thousand pounds per square inch to remodel tissue. That's why foam rolling and, you know, Donnie Thompson's, you know, heavy, you know, uh, you know, stuff doesn't necessarily remodel tissue. It relaxes the nervous system to remodel tissue. And the only way to effectively do it is heavy eccentrics. So the eccentric portion remodels tissue. So that's extremely important for young athletes. And then also the isometric, um, the isometric holds at end range, not, you know, isometric at like, you know, full locked knees, but being able to get down and hold the isometrics at bottom end ranges, uh, that develops stability. Isometric contractions develop stability. That development of stability is paramount for athletes. So remodeling tissue, developing stability and end ranges, and then the compensatory acceleration, the concentric portion, you know, you moving the bar as fast as I can to quote Fred Hatfield, activating white muscles, <laughs> and then mixing that up with either post-activation potentiation PAP, or even a third one like French contrast, where you do something heavy and then you do something dynamic and something fast, uh, is, uh, the basis of my training for the majority in the NFL. Uh, the accentuated negatives were a huge point. Um, the one thing we didn't do a ton of was isometric contractions heavy at end ranges. That was a hole in my own programming. And when I saw Cal get up and, and present his basic, I was like, shit, man, we did, you know, obviously compensatory acceleration using PAP training, uh, which I had used, geez, since, you know, I mean, you're talking about the 90s with Todd Rice, but uh, we always did heavy centrics, but those end range isometric contractions were like the missing piece. And um, uh, adding that back in the program has been extremely important, especially for our athletes. So, um, you know, what it comes down to is regardless of how evolved your system, your system is, the system needs to be able to change the minute that you see a piece. And, uh, I tell people, I'm like, man, I, I missed a piece in this program by adding this in. I think we've created, uh, what I like to think is the best version of training for athleticism. And our program, if you look at like what Cal does and some of the real high level people, our model fits perfectly with what they're doing just because it's based upon movement and not movements. I think when coaches get stuck, Hey, we do these movements in our program. I'm not obsessed with that. Uh, We use this principle of specificity where we're looking to pivot and find the movement that allows you to move best. You know, I I get an example of uh, Victor Hugo, L4, L5, 
Axial loading compression shuts him down. So barbell back squat was out. What do we do? Uh, belt squat. Heavy belt squat for him. Fucking heavier than anybody I've ever seen squat in, in, in the gym on the belt squats. Heavier than I can go. But axial loading shuts him down. So instead of just beating him like a dead horse with a movement that effectively puts him in a negative position, just pivot the movement. Find the best x-axis hinge we can find. You can't be married to <clears throat> something. You know, my quote, which puts me in the gray area is, hey, what do you do? Well, it depends. You know, I'm exchanging text messages with a uh, a dad now. Before somebody trains at the underground, we do a free trial. It's an intro. We assess them. And then I explain to them, it may not make sense to them, but I said, but the assessment never ends. You know, I'm assessing every day. Things change. Your son might, you know, it might be, you know, he goes through a growth spurt. Things change. He psychologically grows. And now he's ready to squat and we built him up physically to squat. He's done enough uh, general physical preparation where we built up structure where he could physically handle it and emotionally handle it. So my answer to a lot of things is it depends. Like you're talking about your guy. He can't load the spine. It fucks him up. I remember Louis Simmons consistently doing rack pulls. You would see him in all his videos. Every time I did rack pulls, I strained a QL, but I would get so fired up watching his videos, trying to copy it. And then you start like assessing. And, you know, after my multiple knee surgeries, I miss uh, like hyperextension of my one knee, which kind of tweaks me up. You have to find what works best for the athlete physically, what works best for the athlete psychologically, what builds their confidence. Sometimes what builds their confidence, you know, Dave Tate mentioned this long ago. He said, you know, we coaches get so caught up in transfer of training. He's like, what about the confidence that you build in an athlete when they build muscle? Isn't that a transfer of training to have a more confident athlete? And in a way, it absolutely is. And that's why, like, I'm still learning. You know, I almost have like a different training model when I'm at my high school and I have a more... Uh, I'd say we're a little bit more advanced or locked in because of the personality traits of the kids at the underground. Those kids are different. The groups are smaller. So I'm able to, you know, change my training according to, you know, it goes back to, it depends not only on where is the athlete physically and mentally, but what equipment is available? What is the, what are the logistics? Um, all these things that that come into play. So I use that answer a lot, but that doesn't attract. Like when I look at Twitter, I'm kind of getting back or X, I'm getting to a place where I'm just going to use X to share content and not really engage because the way, as you've said for so long, for people to engage with you is, do you have polarizing content? I don't have polarizing content. I have, in my opinion, um, common sense approach. What's what does this person need? What's the feedback that you get? Like, do you, do you get any feedback from people on your content or is it just like you put it out there and because it's not polarizing, people don't necessarily engage with it? Right. I'd say like, if you look at a YouTube video, I'll post four comments, maybe sometimes more comments. Um, it's tricky, you know, from a business standpoint, how do you play the game that feeds into what people want? But most important to me is staying true to myself which may not be the the best um, money maker. Like I know that if I tr changed the underground to some sort of like speed and agility only place, we would be fucking packed to the gills. But I know that these kids are fucking, you know, as Louie would say, weaker than the Sunday newspaper. <laughs> you know, I've, I see varsity football players who can't do 10 push-ups, one pull-up. I'm seeing, like I said, you know, high level high school athletes who can't do a bodyweight squat. And I've had college coaches tell me, listen, these kids show up, they got footwork for days, but they can't fucking do basic calisthenics. And um, I've had strength coaches I tell used, me uh, like, like that seems so counterproductive because uh, the coaches are making money by kind of putting them in these like speed camps and the time and effort that it would take to have them lift weights isn't a benefit to them. Yeah. And I, and the unfortunate reality is 
you know, I've lived in my bubble for so long, right? I'm training people out of the underground. Then I'm at Division One universities. Then I'm at Summer Strong. And you think everybody understands that they got to be strong and put on muscle and be explosive. And then you start getting around, you know, quote unquote, you know, common athletes. And then you realize a lot of them don't like to train at all. They don't want to lift heavy. They just want to play the sport and maybe do a little bit of quote unquote speed and agility, but they don't want to get under a heavy bar. They don't want to train all summer long. And the environment is you, uh, the environment you're around kind of determines where, what kind of people you see, you know, I live by the beach and by the beach, a lot of people move here for a certain lifestyle, you know, to be at the beach, to relax. My gyms that were in North Jersey were a lot more being around parents who were more feed their kids to the wolves. Like I, we were training kids in fifth grade. I don't like to train kids in fifth grade, but then I would train these kids in fifth grade and they were fucking about it. They were dumbbell squatting, dumbbell benching, doing pull-ups, rope climbs, jumping. They were doing aggressive things. Whereas I'll, I still remember when I first opened my gym in Manasquan, I'm a mile from the beach. I remember a kid like taking his phone and like hiding, checking his phone. And I remember like looking if there was like a hidden camera. I was like, what the fuck is this? And I started. I was getting a lot of kids by the beach who were more the parents of like, Hey, we'll do this when we have time. We'll kind of get there when we can. We're busy this summer. Busy this summer means I'm sitting on the beach and I'm surfing all summer. It takes a different type of person to say in the morning, I'm going to wake up early and have breakfast and then eat eggs and toast and bacon or whatever that is. And then I'm going to go to the underground at 9 a.m. I'm going to fucking smash some training. And then after that, I could go, maybe I have a job or maybe I go uh, hang out a little bit. But then in the evening, I'm at baseball or I'm at basketball or I'm at wrestling. And so there's like these different environments, very much like Dagestan has the uh, hotbed of wrestlers and fighters. They are up and down mountains. They are immersed in a certain culture from a young age. And so culture impacts the kind of people you're around. And what I've learned from coaching at a high school is not everybody wants to be a killer. Many are perfectly happy with being on a team and barely ever starting or never starting or not having a winning team. It's only this small percent. And so now my job and what I'm trying to get better at is building a culture where everybody wants to win and be part of a championship team. And I'm trying to start it as you need to start by being a great teammate and showing up. Do you, do you think that that's, so, do you think that's intrinsic in kids? Um, you know, I mean, somewhat. It, um, like it depends. <laughs> I hate to say it. Well, I mean, it's it, uh, like, we fail at the margins of our experience. So whenever I listen to this, I just always kind of go back to my older brother and, you know, the fact that he was, uh, my brother still to this day is like, uh, there's, I, I kind of put people in two camps. There's kind of like the Pete, well, three camps. There's people that don't do want to do anything. There's mm -hmm. people that'll only do something if somebody else plans it. And then there's doers. So my brother, Ed's a doer. Like when we were kids, he'd like come in and be like, Hey, uh, like eight in the morning, eat breakfast. Come on. We got to go. And like, he had a whole day planned out. We're going to get our bikes. We're going to do this. I mean, I, and to, to some extent, my wife accuses me of being somewhat lazy with planning. And it was because my brother was such a planner, like, um, and funnily, like, uh, hilariously, uh, impulsive. like, um, he went out on a guy's boat and was like, man, this boat's pretty cool. I'm thinking of getting a boat. And I was like, did you buy a boat? He's like, yeah, I already bought one. Like, <laughs> he like bought a boat and we'll go down and like he's like well i'm like what, what are you doing today he's like i had the afternoon off so i'm just going down to the boat i'm gonna go drive it around and go you know and like go out and he just is like a doer uh, uh like uh, you know call him he's always in the process of doing something i don't think i've ever called my brother he's been like what are you doing i'm sitting here on the couch relaxing watching a movie i would did he learn that from your dad <clears throat> You know what? My dad at like night, we would come home after we ate. Like he would always like hang out and we'd have to, I don't know, watch something like 60 minutes or some nerdy shit. Um, but for the most part, my dad never sat around and my mom never sat around. 
Um, and if my mom, so my mom can't sit around, like maybe now she does cause she's older, but he like, this was hilarious. So if we were going to sit around and watch TV, my mom didn't want to watch TV. So she did a uh, needle point. Do you remember needle point? Like they would have, uh, like, like, so imagine like somebody paints uh, a picture on a canvas and then instead of like, you know, uh, like filling it in, what you would do is you would use like thread and then they would like needle point and like, oh, yeah. like, extreme. yes. So my mom did these like super extravagant needlepoint things that would take her years and she would do like pictures and, and her and her sister, like she would do half, then she would mail it to her sister and her sister would do the other half. So it was kind of like, you know, my sister, my aunt was up in Canada, it was my godmother. So it was kind of a way for them to stay connected, you know, before, uh, text message and videos and all the stuff that we did, it was like a phone call, but what they would do is they would constantly be like working on stuff. And then my mom would work on it in secret. And then just send, do like do half of it, then send it to her sister to do the other yeah. half. And so they just played this game for years. But um, environment. Like, yeah, my parents were never like big <clears throat> around. Uh, so and- if your parents were lazy, John, I believe um, you and your you you have two brothers or one. Yeah, no, I got two brothers. My, my oldest brother, uh, and then my, my middle brother Ed is like the doer. Uh, my, my older brother is too, to some extent, but my brother Ed is just like. Are they both uh, lawyers? Uh, no, my oldest brother went to law school but never practiced. He figured out that uh, you know doing construction insurance, and he's got a he's basically CEO of this big construction firm. Um, but the the insurance stuff was more beneficial. I don't think he ever really i mean he went to law school more because my dad expected it i don't think he ever expected to practice whereas my other brother you know he's been in practice for you know god knows john well this goes back to um you brought this up many years ago i wrote about it i think it wound up like it could have been a book i did a massive blog post dan john may have spoken about this uh genetics geography yeah. environment and so well, you uh, know genetics oh go ahead Dan John uh, gave one piece of that. It was um, his was the geography piece that Mm -hmm. you want to be a hammer thrower. You better either uh, come from Finland or live in a small town in Utah. Like you have to have the geography to be around it. Um, I I Dagestan for MMA fighters. I I added the genetics and opportunity piece because I think there you go is the greatest determining factor for athletic success. Do you have the opportunity to do something like look at, uh, I mean, like look at the stories, right? I, I think it's super fa- uh, hilarious that like now, like the top basketball players in the world come, are coming out of Europe. I mean, it's uh, like, uh, what's the, um, the guy for Dallas, um, Cro- they're in Croatia. They play, uh, <clears throat> is it, um, who is it? Luca? Yeah, Luca. I mean, you you look at these guys and like, why are they as good as they are? And uh, I think it's um, God. Who who who's the comedian? Uh, shit. Did that? Uh, we we went over to the mothership and saw him. Sean, uh, Shane Ellis. No, Shane uh, Gillis. yeah, Shane Gillis. He did a whole thing that um, the reason that the Europeans are so good is because uh, they don't get their egos killed when they're like 10 years old. He's like, every like white kid thinks they're a pretty good basketball player. You're 10, 11, 12 years old. And then there's some out kid out there dunking. And he's like, I'm going to set picks or play football. And he's like the audacity to think that you can play in the NBA. He goes, that gets kicked out of white kids pretty early. But in Europe, these like European players, they don't have that. So now they're out there crushing it. I thought that was a funny skit. Did you see but, uh, the video? the video of the basketball player where they're like, Hey, how did you respond to the, the crowd booing? He's like, brother, I play in Croatia. And then they show like the, the uh, Croatian basketball game. There's like fire going, there's people chanting, like it's a European soccer game. Huh. And so that goes to environment. And this is why we see some of these like inner city football or basketball teams just dominating. And I'm thinking to myself, they don't have a strength coach. Um, they have probably kind of a high stress life, you know, probably, uh, don't have both parents in the household. Their food is probably shit, but they play a ton of street ball. They're street tough. They've grown up fighting. And so they segue into these sports and they are beating teams that have maybe talent, but they don't have, uh, the, the grit. And when you mention opportunity, I think of 
what my wife and I have done for our kids. Sometimes, you know, my kids get loud. They're like, yeah, what did you do in wrestling? I'm like, bro, I never had a fucking private lesson in my life. Your first baseball lesson at age five was a private. <laughs> so yeah. like your middle, uh, I, I tell you, oh, I your middle name is private lesson. Uh, I pulled it up. <laughs> uh, uh, Jokic, um, Nikola Jokic, number one uh, for the Den- um, Denver Nuggets. They ranked him as the number one basketball player. Uh, second is Giannis. Uh, number three, Steph Curry, and then number four is Luca for the Mavericks. So I mean, it's pretty good. I mean, you know, who who would have thought that the best players in the NBA are a bunch of white dudes? But they're all Europeans. So I mean, is it that the culture just kind of fits for it? Um, I really believe that opportunity or genetics, geography, and opportunity. Like, do you have the genetics right? If you're going to want to play in the NFL and play offensive line, you better be six four, six five. Like now, these guys are reaching six seven, six eight. You know, I mean, some of these guys. Genetics is a real thing that people don't want to admit. <clears throat> well, they have to admit it because uh, there's no five foot ten offensive lineman in the NFL, right? Like, you better be running like a four one if you're five ten as a receiver. So, I mean, like, and that's a genetic thing, right? Genetics, geography. Are you raised around it? Is a sport that you have opportunity, or uh, you know, like genetics, geography? So now, is it happening where you are? I mean, if you come from, if you look at the majority of the NFL. It really fits within this like Florida, Texas, California kind of, you know, big swath. I mean, obviously there's some players obviously from other states, but the majority of the NFL comes from these other states. And do you have the opportunity to do it? Is it important? Do you have a, you know, like if I wanted to wrestle, for example, it really helps to be from Iowa. I mean, you look at like some of these top wrestling kids come from places that have, I mean, you know, uh, our mutual friend and, you know, power athlete, uh, Matt Pollock comes from upstate New York where kids wrestle, they play football and they do lacrosse. Those are their three sports. And, uh, like, you know, when I grew up, there was no lacrosse and wrestling wasn't necessarily a big part of the culture. Um, I remember kids wrestled, but it was only the little dudes that didn't play football. Right. right. In California, there's pockets, actually a buddy of mine, a teammate, uh, was in Texas working for flow wrestling. He's now, they hired him at a po- Poway, which has always been big in San Diego. Yeah, so I, that has always been Poway. Poway. <clears throat> yep. So, you know, this opportunity is also a thing. Like people can miss windows of opportunity. Um, sometimes we're training a kid and the bottom line is results take time. And sometimes kids come to us too late and I'm going to break this down. Uh, this past weekend, my daughter and I were traveled to New York three days for a tennis tournament. And lately her tennis game has really like, it was kind of like uh plateaued, maybe getting a little better, a little better. Now she's beating very high ranking players. Um, and she wins like every tiebreaker. She used to lose nine out of 10 tiebreakers. And on the way home, I just had a little like quiet time while she was kind of falling asleep in the car. And I was like, man, my daughter's almost 18. She started playing tennis, I think at age four. And it's been 14 years of just relentless. Her work ethic and commitment is mind blown. Like she'll have a three day tournament and the next day she's strength and conditioning and going to tennis. And I got to tell her, listen, you got to chill out, but it's 14 years of just commitment and driving and traveling and the food and, and the commitment from my wife and I, you know, financial commitment, time commitment. Uh, But my daughter's work ethic has been relentless. And I think people have this assumption. Parents have this assumption that if, you know, you just train my kid for three months before the season, everything's going to be great. It's just not the case, especially the past 15 years as I'm getting athletes who are showing up weaker than ever before. So now it's taking me longer to get your son and daughter results and also their, uh, you know, environment slash opportunity. What food is in the house? I could see a kid a mile away who eats a ton of carbs and processed food. And I could see a kid a mile away who eats a lot of steak, potatoes, and eggs. Like you said, different physique from lifting, but also different physique, different physique from the food that's in the house. And so it's not odd for me to be like marinating chicken overnight and waking up early and grilling at 6 a.m. to make sure my kids have chicken and rice every day for lunch. You know, last night came home from the gym, I'm grilling 
hamburger patties from the Amish farm. And is everybody willing to feed their kids high quality food and seek out a high quality coach versus the coach that's five minutes away? You know, that's why I often say convenience and excellence is rarely found on the same road. It's just, it's rare. And so are there a lot of coaches and a lot of opportunity? Yes. Are they great or just good enough? And those are big difference makers in my experience, not just opinion, but experience. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's an interesting commentary. Um, but I, um, to take it back a little bit, I, I experienced some interesting stuff at Cash's baseball game recently. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, the one coach was fine. Or sorry, there was three coaches, and then add a fourth if you add the coach's wife who was managing the dugout, uh, who was, um, what's the right word? Um, pretty militant yeah. in how she treated these kids to the point where I was like, Jesus, I wouldn't want this to be my mom. I mean, like fucking yelling and snapping and these kids got to sit down. I mean, like I was like, Jesus, spare the rod, spoil the child type of shit. Uh, but, uh, one of the coaches, um, who, uh, looked like he lifted weights, um, shaved head, big beard lawyer, which is kind of surprising. Uh, just because in California, you wouldn't have a guy with like a fucking grizzly Adams beard, but uh pretty fit. Looked like he'd lift some weights. Um, Super uninterested to ever talk to me. So whenever, um, and I'm just saying that most of the sports and most of the fathers that I've met are always like, dude, you're a fucking massive dude. Did you play sports? And I'm like, yeah, I played in the NFL. And they're always excited to have these conversations. And I'm always happy to do it. Uh, always, always cool to talk to people, especially about, you know, the, you know, the training and everything. This guy had zero fucking interest to talk to me. So I, you know, <laughs> When I, when I usually meet those guys, it's because like, I'm the alpha, you know, and there can only be one alpha. So I'm not going to talk to the other guy. <laughs> I don't subscribe to alpha beta fucking omegas. I don't subscribe to any of that shit. Uh, I think if somebody identifies himself as the alpha or writes a book about how to be an alpha, they're not a fucking alpha. You're and, automatically out. Yeah, you're out. And if, and if you in your mind, like have this alpha mindset, you're a fucking beta bitch because the fact, <laughs> like, like you talk about a lack of authenticity. Uh, that's the most inauthentic shit I've ever come across in my life. And thank God it's kind of died out a little bit, but there was a time there where like, you know, dudes were selling, you know, the Andrew Tate $750 course where I'm going to teach you how to be an alpha over the fucking. <laughs> and like, it's, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess out there. You need to be an alpha with your Bugatti. So I'm going to teach you how to get a Bugatti by being an alpha. Now pay me money. It's, um, it's a fucking landmine for fucking schlubs. Like, I'm just sorry. You're a fucking schlub. So if anybody that's listening to this has purchased those courses on how to be an alpha, I'm sorry. <laughs> Ask for your money back. Uh, you we have a camp. We have a camp for that, John. <laughs> oh, God. We're gonna... I mean, the, um, what, what's it called? Like the Knights Guild, uh, where, where those guys pay like 15 grand to basically get their shit pushed in and selection and like basically go through buds <clears throat> by a bunch of former, uh, you know, I would, yeah, just join a jujitsu club. <clears throat> well, I think uh, um, jujitsu is pretty interesting because uh, my experience with jujitsu, I think, is atypical. It's not typical for what most people. I think people go and they're looking for fitness and looking for this. Uh, yes, I got thrown into a jujitsu thing because to train some of the best dudes in the world, and you know, by default, got into it. And, uh, uh, now I'm kind of a jujitsu snob in that if I go to class and there's not dudes that are going to literally fucking rip my head off, I don't feel like it's a good experience. Like, I don't want to go to jujitsu and just flow roll and, you know, work with. <laughs> so before oh, I sign up here, is anybody going to try to kill me? <laughs> I literally want to go into it with a dude that can fucking triangle me and fucking snap my fucking 19 inch neck. Like I'm, I'm. <laughs> this thing to get absolutely fucking obliterated by a guy who's of equal size that I train who's really strong whether that be like Victor Philippe or Rosh or any of those dudes I want to show up and train with killers um so like some of the other classes I show up to and if uh like the other day I went to Shanji's class and there were this and uh, we went to go do the rolls and Shanji was like come on like I'm I'm not going to let you roll with anybody in this class and so then Shanji beat the shit out of me for fucking 15 minutes and rolling with Shanji is uh i fucking love it because just when i think i'm in a good position and i'm gonna pass his guard or do something good he like thwarts me with like a pinky or a toe and then i have to remember that this dude 
for 20 years in competition, nobody passes guard. Harger Gracie never passed his guard. And, you know, of the five of the three times Hodger Gracie ever lost in competition, two were to Shanji. And like, I just, when I think I'm doing good, Shanji fucking does something. And all of a sudden I'll end up in a bad position. I'll be like, fuck. And then he'll be like talking shit to me the whole time being like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Stop doing this. We've talked about this. Why don't you, you know, and just motherfucking me. And, uh, to the point where the other day, um, uh, he was on the bottom and I, I went for like a pass and I was trying to work it and I took my sleeve and I raked it across his face to be a fucking asshole. So then five minutes later, he has my back and he's holding me and he's taking his sleeve and raking it across my face. So I ended up with like a whole bunch of burn marks on my eyebrows. Oh yeah. yeah it was- get, the, get the, get the gee burn. I, I met Shanji in 2007. I don't know if he was competing, but it was at the Arnold I'm sport hurt. festival. They yeah. were, it yeah, was with, with he and his brother. Oh yeah, that I think back then he lived in California because uh yeah, he did. Yeah. He and his brother uh started um Jiu-Jitsu University, which was co- open to anybody to train. And uh but Sala, who's his older brother, uh is, who was also, you know, in the Hall of Fame and world class, uh is a, a complete psychopath as well. And I have to remember that for Shanji's entirety, he has been getting the shit kicked out of him by an older brother. And all of these like world-class dudes and is, you know, has never had his guard passed and is really good. And, uh, I have a fun time training with him. So I always geography, you know, for them, it's geography and environment. And he was literally born into it and around it. And well, and, and, and and then you look at Victor. So, uh, you know, Victor, uh, you know, moves to America when he's 17, you know, comes here basically like sleeps in the gym and just gets the shit kicked out of him by Salo and Shanji for the last fucking seven, eight, nine years. And then goes out to competition. And now that he's big and strong and we've given him the gift of strength, which I, um, it's the secret weapon. Well, well, I don't know how to explain this to people, but it's almost like, and I was trying to explain this to my daughters and they're like, I, I think because it's something I want, they don't want to do it, which is a typical parent thing. So I was trying to like, now I've got my wife in on it and my daughter and my, my wife was trying to explain it to the girls. If you get good at lifting weights and, and training, you will physically look and feel the way that you want for your entire life. And if there ever gets to a point where you don't feel the way that you like, or you're not happy with how you look or you feel this or whatever, you will have a set of skills to get you back. And my wife was telling, she's like, you know, I, uh, um, in, it was either college or grad school. She went and studied abroad in Australia. And she's like, we went out and drank every single night and I put on some LBs and I was feeling like shit. I just, my clothes were tight. I was not feeling. And my wife's, um, like her, like being in shape and, and her physical like presence, cause she's not a big person is extremely important to her. And she like, not only wants to be strong, she wants to feel and look the part. And, uh, she might be in better shape than anybody I know in my life. And your wife is, is ripped. It's oh, super impressive. He's fucking shredded to the point where like anywhere we go, people ask her about working out. They don't even ask me a question. <laughs> she just goes, I follow yeah. this big lug does. Um, but the, um, uh, she's like, you know, you're going to get to a point in life where maybe you ate too much or, you know, this, or you didn't do what you were supposed to. And you fallen off the wagon. If you don't have a skill set to get you back and you develop this skill set as you're younger. So you learn how to eat, you learn all these things and you have access to the best in the world to get you along. So learn this now because you don't want to have to learn this lesson in your twenties and thirties. Learn it. It's now. Cra- I had this conversation with my daughter in the car ride talking about if when tennis is over, you know, we when she's played in Florida at a country club, you see like 90 year olds playing tennis. I said, but you always need to stay fit. You and I had the conversation about kind of the state of men. You know, that could be a whole nother podcast about kind of what we've seen with their bodies and their physiques. But I had that the same conversation that your wife is having with your girls. Yeah. About that ability to transform yourself. It's a tool that you could use forever. <laughs> And, and with, with Victor, um, because, you know, they came and, you know, came from Brazil and, you know, jujitsu, jujitsu, I don't know if he understood the gift and for him, it's body armor, it's protection. So when he travels and doesn't consistently lift weights, same shit happens to me. 
Like if I don't lift weights and train every week, all of a sudden, uh, father time starts creeping back on me and things feel a little funny. My knee feels a little wonky in this. And I realize I'm like, oh shit, I got to go lift weights. Same thing That's for right. Him. You know, he, he missed a couple of weeks and all of a sudden, you know, a rib came out in the back and this and started having all these ticky tech injuries. And he's like, why the fuck is this happening? I'm like, dude, cause you fell, cause you stepped off the path. You have to stay on the path for the rest of your life for you to do what you want. You have effectively yes. like received the gift of strength and the gift of strength is a jealous mistress. So when you leave her alone for a little bit, she's going to get pissed and you're going to fucking feel it. And his durability and everything that he does now is predicated on his training to the point where he went up to, uh, Oklahoma to go train with Lovato, uh, this week. And, you know, uh, I'm sending him his workouts. He's videoing everything, sending it back and he's training. He's got a pretty good guy up there. Um, that Lovato trains with, uh, yes, I know that guy. Um, his Green. name's, uh, yeah, last Luke, I think. Yeah. Luke Green. So, he's, um, yeah, Luke Green. I love what you're saying about the durability. So I, I think that's a, you know, going back to the state of strength and conditioning, I think that's a massive missing link in a lot of strength and conditioning programs. I think a lot of strength and conditioning slash sports performance programs got kind of so specialized and so power and speed based that there lacks a lot of durability. But listen, I got to run in a few minutes, but Johnny, you didn't finish what the story was with your son's baseball. We were talking uh, about the so, parents uh, of so when we grew up. One of the uh, the opposing parents um, hit up the commissioner because they said that the the coaches on our team were uh, being negative towards their kids and were like coaching, like were uh, improperly coaching them. That they were standing up there yelling at them to go and stay, and they were like trying to like coach their kids into disarray, and then also being negative and rude to their kids. So, their own kids no uh on the opposing oh, the opposing okay so then those parents were arguing back and forth and came over and were motherfucking those people they went to the commissioner and wanted that game struck to not count got into this whole thing and this is fucking hilarious because this is happening while i'm at the game and i don't see any of this shit i'm like sitting there like i bring my chair i'm like post it up catch you how to go watching him play he's killing it and uh, this whole thing goes down and I get back and like there's a, a parent text message chain, which I'm not on, of course, because I refuse to be on that shit. And um, uh, Kate's like, did, did you see what happened at the game? And I'm like, yeah, they won. They did great. Like, <laughs> the drama. And I'm like, no, what drama? So then at like the next game, the final game, they have to have the commissioner at it. And and then they brought in like, like the, you know, and they, the problem too, is they got these like 13, 15 year old kids doing ump, which I did. I did that job. So I know it's hard, but at least they have two kids. We only had one and uh, uh, they're just kind of lackadaisical, typical fucking uh, ice right. cream. Uh, their haircut looks like broccoli or ice cream, whatever the fuck it is. That's right. I'll wear like super short shorts and like knee high, like mid light, mid calf socks and like this fucking <laughs> it's a mess. Well, you either have a young kid or you have like a seven year old guy who, you know, look, I'm 48 and I can't really see well, what the hell the ball is doing. <laughs> and it's coach pitch. Right. So it's, it's just, it, it was a mess, but these parents, like, I didn't even see this shit go down and uh, it was a fucking mess. So I, um, I'm amazed for set, you know, eight, nine year old kids, how fucking intense these parents take this stuff. But I also have to remember too, um, I, uh, as a, a summer job or as a, a job, I umped a uh, girl softball. It was like 20 bucks a game. So my mom would drop me off at umping like two games and I would fucking go home. And, uh, one of the, and just mind you it was one kid, right? So behind the plate calling this, I, I probably fubbed a call something. I called somebody out that shouldn't have been out. This fucking dad charges me out of the, um, out of the dugout. And basically, like, you know, I got a chest protector, rips the chest protector off and is like poking me in the chest, driving me backwards. And I was like, a, you know, freshman had been lifting weights. So, I mean, I was probably 185 pounds. So I fucking two hand jacked this old man back and fucking <laughs> fall down. Right. He literally poked me and was pushing me, like screaming in my face. That's insane. Dang. And I fucking two hand jack him. He falls to the ground. The parents all run out. I never got asked to umpire again. And I got fired for that because of that fucking asshole. So like, I have a, a pretty good, uh, like always watching out for those kids. And I always go talk to them. I'm always like, Hey man, you guys got to be fucking on the ball, dude. Or these parents are going to fucking eat you alive. Right. This is important to these people, but it's amazing how competitive people are. And I think because they didn't play at a high level, so they don't understand. 
And uh, right, they don't understand um, the kind of imperfection of competition and what happens in sports, and that this shit takes time. But John, we're seeing your experience as a fourteen or fifteen year old freshman. We're seeing this happen on the regular, and if you maybe come across uh, it, we're seeing a lot of coaches getting out of the kind of uh, high school sector and just opting to do club and private coaching. Um, And even, you know, stepping away from that, a lot of coaches are leaving because they're tired of parents who are complaining, being entitled for kids that maybe sometimes should be playing more, but for the most part, um, you know, they're putting their kid up way too high on a pedestal and, uh, it's just a shame, really, in my opinion, what's happening to a lot of sports. But I got to run, my man. This um, we'll have to do the you know part eight. I'm not sure how often I've been on Power Athlete, but you know we spoke a lot about kind of men losing their physical edge, their mental edge. I want to talk about that next time. Okay, let's deep into it. We'll we'll set a date and uh, we'll reboot. So thanks, Eva. Yeah, brother. Thanks for being on Power. You're the best. You're the All best. right, my brother. No. Talk to you later. You're the best. See you. <laughs> Later. Hey there, Power Athlete Nation. Big shout out to all the heavy hitters who stuck around till the final whistle. If you've been soaking in the knowledge bombs and epic tales you've been dropping for free, here's your chance to be a game changer. Swing by klfi.com slash power athlete and toss a few bucks our way to keep the podcast fueled and firing on all cylinders. That's ko-fi.com forward slash power athlete. Your support makes a difference. See ya.